Welcome to the Successful Life Podcast. I am your host, Corey Barrier, and I am here with Gourmet Goes Keto. What's up, Gourmet? How's it going, man? How's it going? Good to talk to you. Good. Yeah, you too, do you? I mean, it's taken us a minute to connect, but I'm so super, it has. super glad that we finally connected and we can thank our buddy Caleb for, mm-hmm. uh, you know, setting us up and uh, he's oh, done yeah. that with several people. Um, you know, he's, he's overall, he's just such a great guy. Oh, yeah. Really oh, he, he definitely is. He definitely is a great dude. He really is. So, um, so Gourmet, the reason I said Gourmet goes keto because that's his IG handle. And so the re, you know, after we hear this fucking mind blowing story, mm-hmm. um, then you guys are going to understand why it's Gourmet goes keto. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, Gourmet, you know, tell us. Uh, so you were saying that you you do marketing during the day and then you do some some other things at night and then you also have a podcast right yep oh yeah oh yeah okay what is the name of your podcast i forget uh my podcast is the fat guy forum the fat guy forum it's gotcha. primarily yeah it's it primarily is about um it's a space for for dudes dealing with weight issues to tell their stories at all stages of their journeys so it's it's not one of those traditional like a lot of the traditional fitness podcasts are like guys that gain 40 pounds in the off season from their their athletic days and dealt with that like this is guys that have been dealing with weight issues their whole lives i've interviewed guys that have been seven eight hundred pounds four hundred pounds lost a hundred pounds gained a hundred pounds you know like guys just getting started guys that have finished their journeys like at all stages so it's really about trying to give a space for for men's stories about um dealing with being fat guys basically sure well, you know, I'll, really quickly, I'll share just a little bit about my story with you because I think mm-hmm. you'll appreciate it. Um, when I was, uh, you know, I was a fat kid growing up, mm-hmm. uh, and, and it and simply because my parents, you know, my parents, you know, I, I was born in 1978, so like mm-hmm. uh, fat, fat free was the diet, which you and I both know that shit doesn't work, oh, yeah. um, you know, or or low fat, and and, and we didn't even follow that really. So I was just my my parents fed me poorly. Not poorly. We ate great food. It just wasn't great for your body, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. uh, in between my sixth and seventh grade year, I, you know, the, I, I climbed up on a diving board, and these three girls, I thought they thought I was cute, and and the reality is, is they wanted to see my tits bounce up and down. Mm-hmm. And so, when I realized that, I was, you know, it destroyed me. You know, I was mm-hmm. so, dude, I was fucking devastated. And oh, so sure. I made a. I, I made a promise to myself after that day that I'd do whatever the fuck I had to do. And mm-hmm. so that's exactly what I've done. Now, don't get me wrong. I still battle with, you know, food, sugar, not, I mean, not like I did alcohol. Right. But, uh, but from time to time I'll go on a, a tangent that, uh, you know, I'll eat sugar for X number of days, but then, I know that when I hit a certain number, it's, it's scale back time. And then mm-hmm. that's all, it's all it really takes. And that's the easy part for me, opposed to probably a lot of the stories that you've heard. Mm-hmm. And so oh, for I, sure. I certainly can't compare my story with yours, but I mm-hmm. am so thrilled. So I want to hear it, dude. I can't wait. I'm so excited. Okay. Cool. So let's dig um, in. So, I mean, I, I guess we'll start with, I was a fat kid too. I was a very, very fat kid. Um, When I was 10 years old, I was over 200 pounds and my family put me on my first diet and that went well and then I failed and I was very rapidly gaining again after that. And by the time high school came around and I think I was 16, I was 350 Um, and a lot lot of that had to do with um, getting a car. And so once you have a car, you have better access to food and so it's easier to hit drive throughs and go to places where people don't know who you are and, you know, get access to the food. And I was definitely a sneak eater was one of my big things. And I, my family had another, it, I feel like I had a lot of those, that old TV show intervention, a lot of those moments, like, so we had another intervention and um, I graduated high school, a little under 200 pounds, went off to college, very rapidly got back into like the 250, 275 range for most of college. I went to a, a school that had a lot of hills and a lot of walking. So I think that naturally helped keep my weight under control. Um, so really I gradu- quick, do you yep. mind me stopping you just real quick? To go no, me. no, go ahead. Yep. So, so tell me, you know, I, I'm interested to know psychologically, you know, mm-hmm. from, 
from the parents putting you on a diet that that had to be um mm. a challenge psychologically to an extent and then hell going up from 200 to 350 mm. that had to be a kick in the, in the nuts and then going down back down and then now you're going to college right and and, yeah. and, and then you're back up mm -hmm. what the hell, like how did that how did you process all that? that's a lot yeah i don't hmm, like I honestly think like in a lot of ways I didn't process it. Like to me, I, I, when I was being watched by people, I tried to be good. You know, I think I learned that was the lesson. Like when my family was watching, I needed to be good. You know, when they were threatening me, I needed to be good. And when I, I think like many, many families, like I was born, you know, I'm, I'm 46. So I was born in the seventies, grew up in the eighties and early nineties. And um, back then when you dieted, most people's mindset was once you lose the weight, you're cured, you know, you hit the finish line, you're done, everything's fine. So I think that first round, you know, for, it was like from fifth to seventh grade, um, that I went from like 220 to one, I think I even get, to, I get down to like 120, like 125 and which was, you know, an average weight at that point. Um, they stopped watching, like they had been watching me like security cameras for most of that time. And then they stopped watching and I realized it and I realized I could eat again. And um, we had a lot of stuff going on in the family at that time, challenges and my parents divorcing and moving us around and all of that. And I think there probably was a propensity on their part to be like, we'll deal with it when we have to deal with it. And I, I literally kind of snowballed out of control. And for me, it was security, it was comfort. Uh, when after my parents divorced, like I was doing a lot of the cooking for myself and a lot of the eating for myself. And I was I uh, like a lot of kids back then, as soon as I could get a paper route, I had a paper route. As soon as I could get a job, I had a job. And so I was always working and paying for everything, you know, on my own, buying my own food, like buying all that stuff myself and making my own choices. And um, it just I, I don't think parents know how to deal with those issues. Like I really don't. They're not really trained. You know, you don't, you don't get a certification to become a parent. So when you're watching your child expand like a balloon, but you know the food you're providing in the house isn't what's doing it, like, I think there's a panic and they don't know what to do. And you have, you know, my mom working two jobs and all of that kind of became this perfect storm to allow me to slide under the radar and just continue to feed the very real food addiction that I had, I had developed. Like, it was, you know, my every waking thought was about what was coming next food wise, like from that early in my life until, you know, more recently, like it, um, I don't know, like I, I had moments where I would, I would think, okay, this is out of control. You know, I need to do something and I would lose a little bit of weight. And as soon as you lose, and I think a lot of people go through this, like when you're very heavy and your life is restricted by your weight, as soon as you start to lose a little bit of weight and things get a little bit better, you start to think that everything's okay. And then the voices that in your head start telling you, well, you know, if you just keep up what you're doing physically, you know, you could eat a little bit more. And it's never just a little bit more. It was never, you know, just a little bit. And as soon as I left college, my weight ballooned. My weight was, I left, I graduated college a little over 300 pounds. And probably, I would say within a year or two, I was over 400 pounds, easy. Um, I was over 450 pounds, probably for about 20 years of my life, um, easily. Now, were you, and, I mean, what kind of medications and stuff were you on? Like you had to be in, right? I would think. See, no. And see, that's the thing is also like when you're that big, when you're, when you realize that every visit to a doctor is going to turn into a lecture about your weight, you, you stop going to the doctor. I so, see that. and for me, it became at first it was an aversion and then I think it became a phobia. It became a fear. Um, and I, the only time, probably from around the age of 18 or 19, the only real time I've been to an actual doctor was um, in late 2017 was the first time I had been to a real doctor. And that's because I almost died in 2017. So Whoa. I was never on medications. I, um, I, I was never diagnosed with anything. I, I think as I grew older, I think w this is one of the other things I, I think people don't realize is like the human body is really resilient. Like, especially when you're younger and you grow up big, your body can adapt to a lot. Your body can handle a lot. And then one day your body can't handle it anymore. And you start to see things happening. And I 
um, when I got to my heaviest, I knew I was undiagnosed diabetic. I knew that that was, I, I had every symptom. If you pulled up a Google list of what are the symptoms of type two diabetes, I could, I could tick them off for you. I could tell you every one of them, you know, sweating, cold sweats after I was eating, you know, drowsing, you know, sleep issues. Um, I had to sleep sitting up. I was urinating every 30 to 40 minutes. Um, like things were clearly out of control. And, and that was when I was, when I got to my heaviest, which was 540 pounds. Um, that was, yeah, that was, and I was over. And the funny thing, well, not funny, but I guess funny thing <laughs> is I, I was over 500 pounds, you know, for five or six years. And probably for two or three of those years, I didn't see any of those problems, like any of those symptoms. I had physical issues, I, mobility problems. I could barely walk. I could barely stand. I had very little stamina. My legs would swell like balloons. Um, if I got wounds or cuts on my legs, they would leak. Um, so just really quick, Gormy, yeah. walk me through what a day it's, what a day in, in the life of somebody that's 540 pounds. What mm -hmm. does that look, what does it look like? Well, one of the things that I, I like to say about it is when you get that big, you make your world very small. You're, you're not doing a lot. So I had built a, a world for myself, a life for myself that really enabled me to be that big, enabled me to live at that size. Um, I was working in higher education at the time. I was a live-in professional. I was a residence hall dorm director. Uh, so basically, my work and my home were in the same building. So my office was literally a 25 foot walk down the hallway. Um, you know, I, so for me to go to work, it was get up, go to leave my apartment and walk down the hallway. Um, but if you want to think about like what an actual day was like then for me to get up and go to work, you know, it wasn't like jump in the shower quick and in five minutes you're done, you know, taking care of your body when you're that big hygiene, cleaning, you know, all of those things. The fact that like I got to a point when, when I was that big, that showering was a exhausting you know just taking yeah. a shower was exhausting so I, I had a stool that I kept in the shower so I could sit while I was showering you know you have sponges on you know it's it's a joke from the Simpsons but you know a rag on a stick is a real thing like washing yourself you know you sponges on sticks um I mean not to go to a TMI place but you know wiping your ass when you're that big is a challenge um I would, you know I would imagine it's almost impossible uh, I at my heaviest I had an 84 inch waist so Wow. Think about, think about having, so basically having to reach around a boulder to do anything. Um, How did like you I, sit on a toilet? Like, um, well, luckily living in a residence hall, the toilet in my apartment was um, a handicap accessible toilet space. Um, also a sturdier toilet. Uh, I broke, I've broken wall toilets off the walls, you know, the floating toilets. Yeah. Couldn't, if I walked into a bathroom and that was all they had, I couldn't use it. You know, I would no, not to sit down. I actually sat on one at Disney World once in Epcot and broke it off the wall. Um, started flooding the bathroom. Uh, two days later, it was still that bathroom was still out of order. Um, I hope Disney World doesn't you know listen to this podcast and try to backcharge me for for that repair. But there's just there's a lot of things in life you don't think about. Like getting out to my car was difficult. By the time I got to my car, breathing was a challenge. You know, so I I. This is one of those things that I reflect on too with it. Like I basically ate myself so big that it was impossible for me to go get food. Like walking a grocery store became impossible. So luckily or not so luckily, the early 2000s was when they started introducing grocery delivery. So I could get grocery deliveries done and I could have that happen two or three times a week, whatever I wanted. And uh, working in with college students, there's always someone going to a fast food place or going somewhere to pick up food. And it's always easy to find someone to order a pizza with, or even I would send to like, I, I had a thing where I, I received like meal plan points to use in the dining hall, but walking over to the dining hall was near impossible for, for the distance from the residence halls. So I would find students that needed the points, you know, needed the meal plan points themselves, have them go get their food and pick something up for me. You know, it was always easy. The access was there, you know, it was, it was what my life had become about, you know, enabling me to continue to eat food, like grocery delivery, food delivery. I remember uh, I had a cold once when I was that big. And usually when I felt a cold coming on, I would throw some cold medicine into my grocery order. So I knew I would have something in stock. I, I had run out of NyQuil basically and needed some. 
And I remember driving to a, a drugstore and knowing that if there was a line at the, at the counter, I wasn't going to be able to stand long enough to buy the, buy the medicine. So I sat in my car and watched for when it looked like the store was pretty empty. Basically made a beeline inside to get to the NyQuil, grabbed the NyQuil, got up to the front. And then somehow in that time, that probably 90 seconds, there were four or five people online in front of me. So I put, the, I put the NyQuil down and I went out to my car and I sat in my car. And I waited for those people to leave. And then I ran back in, grabbed it from where I left it, got in line, paid, and left. Um, it was not a great existence. It was not, I would avoid plans with friends if I didn't know that I could be comfortable the place I was going to. Um, I would avoid plans with family if I just felt too tired. Uh, I also would avoid plans if I felt like it was going to disrupt what I wanted to eat that night. Like if I was going to be able to get the food I wanted, you know, and I would rather stay home and eat, I would choose that over going out and interacting with people. Like, I was deep, deeply lost, I think, for a long, long time. Yeah. I can identify that and, with alcohol, you know, alcohol, mm -hmm. I, I would plan whatever I had to do around alcohol. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I understand that that portion of it. Holy shit, dude. And it's funny, because I didn't, even initially lose weight because I had a wake up moment where I was like, you know, holy shit, I'm 540 pounds and I need to do something. Um, it was because I had moved cross country to leave the job I was in. Um, the move cross country didn't work out, didn't go well. Um, I moved in 2008, which is when the economy collapsed in the United States. I moved from Rhode Island to California. And if you go back and look at the stats at that time, the two states with the worst unemployment at that point were Rhode Island and California. Um, yeah, I, I, I was making great choices. Right. And, and because I voluntarily left my job in Rhode Island, the state of California would not give me access to any benefits. Basically, they're like, you screwed yourself. We're sorry. So I cashed out some retirement. I tried my best to find work. But let's be realistic. When there's a shortage of jobs already, and there's many, many applicants, and one of the applicants looks like he's going to die just walking into the interview, who's going to hire that person? You know, not let's, not exactly. Like, I, I'm not trying to say this from a perspective, you know, of being like fat negative or anything along those lines, you know, as people might get mad at me for that. But realistically, someone who's doing hiring, they're hiring someone to interact with their clients, their customers, whatever the job is. If you're so out of shape that they're having trouble interacting with you at an interview, why would they, why would they, even if on, on paper, your resume looks like the best thing they've ever seen, why on earth would they make that decision? Like, I don't fault anyone for that. You're right. So I kind of started what I, I call initially the poverty diet. Um, I moved back to Rhode Island and, and here's something a lot of people also don't want to hear. When you don't have money to buy food and you're not eating as much food, you start to lose weight. You know, <laughs> the weight starts to come off. It happens. Like, there are going to be a lot of people that are like, I don't even eat that much and I don't lose any weight. Like when you're that big, you're eating enough to keep yourself that big. You, you just are, you know, unless you have a weird metabolic condition that affects one in 10 million people, you're, you're eating enough to keep yourself that big. And so my weight started to drop. I started to get a little more mobile and I realized that if I wanted to find work, I needed to do something about it. So I decided to put my time to good use and, I, I started what was basically kind of a clean eating paleo diet at that point. Uh, paleo was all the rage um, in like the, the 2009, 2010 time. And I went from 540 to 210 pounds. My goal was get to 210 pounds by your 40th birthday, uh, which was 2013. Okay. So it was spring of 2013. I had gotten down to 210 pounds. Um, I didn't. What's the best way to phrase this? Like, it's not like I was a fool and I thought that I was cured. Like I didn't, that wasn't the, the mindset, that thing that happened with me then. What I realized was, and what I realized now in, in hindsight is during that period, I focused exclusively on making the scale move. You know, it was about getting weight off. It wasn't about doing any work at all on my mindset, on my identity. Uh, I had built an identity around being the happy fat guy. And had no idea who I was when I wasn't that person. So I got the weight off and very, it, it's almost like when 
when you reach that point in a, in a weight loss journey and you don't have a plan for what comes next, it's very easy for the old behaviors and the old voices and the addictions to come back in and say, well, you don't know what you're going to do. We're still here for you. Yeah. You know, you're scared. Come back home. And uncomfortable. Come back home. Yeah, yeah. No, you're scared and uncomfortable. So I went on a, a vacation for my 40th birthday, did great on vacation, flying home, made the decision to have a cheat meal. Um, that turned into a cheat day the next day. By the time I had decided to have a cheat day, it had turned into a cheat weekend. Uh, by the time the weekend was over, I decided to take a week off from my diet completely and just eat whatever I wanted. Now, that first weekend, I put on 30 pounds um, without even really trying. You know, like, and obviously, 30 you're not gaining, pound? Yeah, and you're not, and, and let's talk biology. You're not gaining 30 pounds of fat in, in three days. You're not. That's just not possible. But my body at that point was so starved of food and by the time I got down to 210, I was not just eating a very clean diet. Uh, I was eating very low calorie and I was doing alternate day fasting without properly fasting, not preparing myself. So I was basically starving myself. And so, so, so really we, quick, I, talk, walk us through that, what you meant right, right there yeah. uh, with, with the fasting and not doing it right. And, and what were you mm -hmm. doing then? And what do you know now? Yeah. Well, what I know, what I know now is that when you're approaching fasting, it's not necessarily even about calorie restriction per se. You know, intermittent fasting is about, you know, creating a shorter eating window. When you're approaching extended fasting, you want to think about electrolyte supplementation and, you know, the, the other needs of your body to keep every kind of like, for the, example, the chemical systems in place, you know, to keep your so supplement with sodium and potassium and magnesium and things along those lines. True. And you want to be hydrating yourself well and, you know, all of those things. And I was probably eating anywhere to, from 800 to 1000 calories on the days that I was eating. And then not eating, and then eating 800 to 1,000 calories and not eating. So, so like a whole day, you would take a whole day off from not eating? Mm -hmm. You fast a whole oh, yeah. 24 hours? Okay. Oh, yeah. And what was your window the next day for, for eating? So, so then I would, I would eat two small meals that were primarily um, low-carb vegetables with some protein and a little bit of fat. You know, I was wow. eating a very, a very, very low-calorie diet at that point, and that was just to keep the scale moving. It wasn't about, am I doing something sustainable? Am I doing something that I can live with? It was about, I have to see 210. I have to see 210. That became my fixation in a lot of ways. Like I, I had shifted my fixation from food to losing weight. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I think, I didn't think at all about what was actually going on for me on the inside. It was just more about how's the outside doing? Like what's actually happening, you know? I knew I didn't have signs of diabetes anymore. My body was moving and everything was great and I could fit in clothes and I could travel and everything was great. You know, Gordy, so, but, I, I think that's an important statement that you just made that, that people don't, and, and look, I'm guilty of this. Now, uh, the your statement you said about, Will, we look at the outside, not the inside. Dude, the problem, the problem with that whole thing is that, as you know, is that our insides control so much, our gut mm -hmm. and brain, brain you know, there's a connection there. And if, if they're not interacting with each other the right way, mm -hmm. you, you've got bad news bears all oh, yeah. multiple places. Completely, completely. Yeah. And so I crashed and burned hard, hard. I felt by the, like I said, like that, by the time that cheat weekend was over, I had determined I was taking a week off. And by the middle of that week, I had convinced myself that, um, that dieting was, was misery and I was just happier eating. And so I, I even, I think I even said to myself, like in my head, like, you know, when you were around 300 pounds, you could still move and you were still pretty good and you were active and you know, you could still be, live a happy life in the 275, 300 pound range. So if you get there, it'll be fine. You know, don't freak out. Don't worry. Within the first month, I was over 300 pounds again. Um, Oh yeah, I put on a hundred, so I put on a, it was there. And the funny thing is there's, there's after story to this, like that comes up later on uh, when, once I was finally seeing doctors again, but within, I went from, so May 1st of 2013, I was 210 pounds. October 12th of 2013, I was 480 pounds. God, so, no yeah. way. So 
And the funny thing is, like, I tell people this story and there are people that just don't believe it and they think it's made up. And I'm like, I have pictures. I, I have pictures that have timestamps to them, you know, of, of, you know, my life during that time. And I was, you know, posting pictures on social media and um, I so rapidly lost what I had worked for that I, I think I, I just got so, I got lost. Like, I literally got lost and I started to believe, like, I was buying my own bullshit that, well, clearly this is the way your body wants to be if this is the way your body's reacting. Like, not at all paying mind to, am I just feeding an addiction? Or not at all am I, like, allowing this behavior to happen. It was, well, clearly this is the way my body responds. You know, this is because the way my it, body must want to be. Because the programming from, from, oh, a yeah. young, from a young age, you know, you just hadn't been able to break that pro programming. And if, and let's be realistic, like, if that point I had started to take responsibility for myself, like what would have happened to me mentally? Like if I had sat there with myself and said, not, it's, it's not your body making you do this. Like you allowed this to happen in five months. Like, how do you look yourself in the face again? Like it's, it, we build, we build those walls and we build those structures inside of our brains so that we can accept chaos and we can accept insanity. And I fully believe that there's a part of me that's a hundred percent insane. You know, I don't, I don't think there are, if there are people listening to me tell this story thinking, how on earth do you let that happen? Like, how do you do this? Like, how do you, how do we dig into that? Like, I don't claim there's a reason and a pattern and, a, and something that I could tell you uh, someone was holding a gun to my head and making me eat. Like, it wasn't that at all. It was, I retreated back to what was comfortable because I didn't know anything else. And I never made an effort to learn anything else. I never made an effort to think about what I would do next. I never even thought about those days coming. And eventually for me, that evolved into thinking, well, this is how you're going to die. You know, you're just, you're going to eventually eat yourself to death. Like there's no stopping it. So enjoy the time that you have and ride it out and see what happens. Well, the reality is, Gorman, you had more evidence than not that that was the case. Mm-hmm. Oh, completely. I mean, really? Completely. I mean, really? I mean, you oh, yeah. know. I mean, like I was start. I was starting to see. I I was immediately starting to see the the symptoms of diabetes come back. Um, I could not sleep sitting de lying down. You know, I was propping myself up to sleep. I was having to raise my legs up at the end of the day again to help deal with swelling. Like, I was falling to pieces and slowly dying. And I I I, I said this to someone the other day. Like I look at that internet meme of the dog sitting at the table in the burning house and the dog says, this is fine. Like I was literally that dog. I was sitting in a burning house saying, no, everything's fine because there was a plate in front of me that had the food on it that I wanted. You know, I was, you know, I, I've talked to people with different addictions, you know, with drug and alcohol problems. And, and you know, we talk about, you know, the, the sacrifices we make to feed the addiction. And I 100%, you know, I... I, you, you can't sympathize with someone, but I can empathize because I th think about the choices I made to enable me to continue to eat the food that enable me to continue that behavior. And I was okay. Like, I, I think I reached, it's, it, this is the, the scary part for me. It's like, I think I reached a point of peace with it. Like I came to peace with the idea that someday I'm not going to wake up, you know, I'm going to go to bed and I'm not going to wake up and that's what's going to happen. So I actually wrote a letter to my family that I kept by my bed. That was basically me saying, if you, you know, if my body's found, I don't want you to, to think I died sad or that, you know, I was unhappy. I was a happy person and I live my life and please don't feel bad. Like all of this bullshit that I probably wrote more to assuage my own guilt than to actually do anything to help anyone. Like there was nothing about that letter that would, would be, a, like think about that. Like if you found a letter by someone that you loved that died and it said, well, don't worry, you know, I'm, I'm good, you know, pack all my shit up and, and put it in boxes and don't worry about me. Like, and I eventually, it's funny because now I wish I had kept the letter, um, but oh, yeah. I, I did eventually burn it. I, I, I burned it outside at where I live now in the yard. Um, Probably a good thing, actually. I wanted it gone. I wanted it gone from the universe. I wanted that to burn away a mistake that was, was made. Like I, you can't erase mistakes, but I could take away the evidence of that one. You know, that was yeah. one that I could, I could remove. And 
I, like I said, I got back up to the high 400s. I lived there for a couple of years. I, I knew things were coming to a head with the way my body was. I knew that I either needed to make a change again, or I needed to admit that I needed to see a doctor and get put on insulin and deal with medications to help me stay alive if I was going to stay alive. That still wasn't enough for me. That wasn't enough to make the change. The change for me came when my parents were coming into custody of two small children. And um, it's through a family situation. And my parents are in their 60s. And they were taking custody of, of these twins uh, that were just recently were born around that time. And not your twins. Yeah, not mine. Not my children. Okay. Uh, you know, okay. they were not my children. Um, okay. they're, they're actually my nephew's children. Um, okay. And there's a lot of other family drama and mess that we could talk about. But long story short, my parents were the ones that were stepping up. Um, and my dad sitting on his back porch said, you know, very realistically, uh, I'm not going to live to see them graduate college. You know, I, I've worked roofs my whole life. I run a roofing company. You know, I don't see myself living 22 more years, you know, to see that happen. So I need to know that you're going to help. You know, I need to know that you'll help us even now take care of them. And he wasn't like I've told some people this story and they think here, here he is sitting with his 500 pound son, you know, screaming at me to lose weight. And that wasn't what that moment was about at all. That moment was about him admitting his fear for the future, his fear of what he knew his life could be. And it was probably him hard also, for him. Oh, for sure. And, and I think it also was a moment of him realizing we're really doing this. You know, we're not just talking anymore about doing this. We're actually doing this. So I need to put some things in place. You know, I need to have some conversations. And I went home that night and I was actually was talking to someone earlier today about this. And they said, you know, so he, in a way he did, you know, create some guilt for you about your situation. And it wasn't that I went home and said, I owe it to all of these people to lose weight. Like I have to do this, you know, I have to be around for them. Like what I realized was the big picture that I had given up on life, you know, that I had stopped caring about whether I lived or died. And here I was having another person tell me that they needed me to be alive. And it wasn't that he had an answer as to, I'm gonna need you in X number of days, I'm gonna need you to do X, Y, and Z. It was just him expressing, I need you. And I didn't feel guilted by that. I felt for the first time, probably in my whole life, a sense of interconnectedness to other people, a sense yeah. of, a sense that in a way I didn't, I didn't owe my life to them, but I owed, it's like you owe your community something, like you owe, that you owe your family something in, in a way that goes deeper than guilt and it goes deeper than just, doing something for someone else it goes into you know go ahead go ahead well i was just gonna say it's almost like he you know he he believed in you mm -hmm. and and he and he felt like you know and like you said I, I i actually didn't see it as guilt at all he just you felt a sense of purpose at that mm -hmm. time oh yeah exactly which you had none before right i and i and it wasn't and what that <coughs> what that translated to for me was it became a very big picture. Why for me? And the big picture why was, okay, what's the, the first thing that needs to happen is you need to stop dying. You need to stop being okay with dying. And you don't just have to need to stop want, you know, stop being okay with dying. You have to want to live and you have to want to fight to live. Like, because it was going to be a fight. I knew going back into trying to lose weight again, that it was going to war. I knew it was entering into a battle that I had failed and I had lost before. You know, it wasn't just, I'm gonna try again. It was, I need to do this and I need to do it right. And so how do I do this? You know, what are the tools that I need? What do I need to think about? And something I think that's also very realistic is um, when you're a bigger person that struggles with your weight and your weight goes up and down and you have success and failure and all of those things, you never really stop 100% thinking about it. You never let it go completely. So when it became real to me that I needed to do it again, immediately in my head, I started saying, well, here's the things you screwed up last time. You know, here's the things you did wrong. Like, let's go over the things you did wrong. 
Like, let's actually lay it out there. Let's talk about the fact that you, you paid no attention to your mindset. You paid no attention to how the food you were eating made you feel. You paid no attention to how your emotions came into play with any of this. Like, what are the things you need to pay attention to this time? And then I need to think about how I was going to do it. Like, what was my tool going to be? And I looked at all the diets I had been on and what worked best for me and what challenged me and what were the things I struggled with. And I realized that a lower carb way of eating was something that always seemed to be easier for me when it came to actually controlling my food intake. I had stayed up, like a lot of big people, you stay kind of up on diet research and diet popularity and all of those things. So keto was something that was starting to grow at that time, you know, it was becoming a little more prominent. I'd actually bought a couple books in 2016 that I never read. Um, and I hadn't thought about that until I actually was talking to one of the authors of one of them. And so I, go I went into my Amazon history to see when I bought his book. And I'm like, I remember reading that book in February of 2017. I bought that book in April of 2016. <laughs> so I bought those books and I sat on them for almost a year. Um, but I realized that if I was gonna try again, keto was gonna be the way I was gonna try. I'm a 100%, I'm a like a, a light switch flipping guy when it comes to diets. Like I don't ease my way into anything. So it was, I literally had that discussion with my dad on a Thursday or a Friday, it was a Thursday or a Friday. I read the keto books on a Saturday. I cleaned out my house on a Sunday, like got all the food out, went and did some shopping. And Monday morning I was off to the races. It was the, big, the middle of February of 2017. I was 470 pounds. Um, and I started that next adventure. You know, I started uh, not just working on my food and my weight, but also thinking about, you know, why do I want to do this? What, what's important to me? Why am I doing this? I, I actually have a friend who's been through a lot of this with me. He was an old eating buddy from my 540 pound days. And I went to him and I said, you've seen me try and fail a lot over time. You've seen it. Um, when I try to, to back out this time, when that happens, I need you to remind me about these kids. Like, I need you to remind me of what my dad said to me. Like, I need you to throw that in my face. Like, I need you to be that accountability for me. And he agreed and he had to do that once. Um, to be realistic, it did happen. Um, but I dove in and I, I had some great success. Like, like uh, I say a lot, like I'm great at losing weight and I'm great at gaining weight. Like I'm a whiz. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not joking. Like when I say like, you know, I like you, you heard, you've heard my parts of my story. Like I can lose weight. I can gain weight. Um, uh, I can't keep weight off. So that's the challenge. But I started losing weight. I lost, uh, I was probably down around 140 pounds or so in a couple of months and I fell off the rails. Uh, this was the summer of 2017. I fell off the rails hard, went off for a month and gained 40 pounds in a month. Shit. Go me. Um, and, but this time for the first time ever, I put the brakes on, you know, first time ever in my dieting history within a couple of weeks, I had realized that I was screwing up. I put the brakes on and I got myself back in track. Fast forward a couple of months to late November, early December, and I had a cold. I caught a cold. Um, and I thought it went away after a week. I thought I was fine. And I woke up, what was it? I woke up on a Monday and felt like I had gotten run over by a truck. And I was like, okay, cold's back. This is weird. Okay. Went to work that day, went home, went to bed, got up the next morning, felt sicker, skipped my day job that day went to my night job, which was hosting trivia at a bar, and realized that my wind was so low at that point, like my ability to breathe was so impaired, I couldn't walk around the bar to host the trivia. I had to do it from my seat. And got through that night, took the next day off work, and basically spent that whole Wednesday lying in bed realizing, okay, you know, you, you've changed your diet, you're getting yourself healthier, you still haven't seen a doctor in over 25 years. You have a choice right now. You're either going to see a doctor or you're probably going to die. Something really bad is happening. Like, and I cried, honestly. Like, I, at, this, at that point in my life, going to a doctor had gone from being something that I avoided because I didn't want to get lectures about my weight to a real phobia, to like a real intense, overwhelming fear of seeing a doctor. 
I, I laid there in bed thinking, okay, not only are they going to tell me I have pneumonia or something like that, they're going to diagnose diabetes. They're going to diagnose high blood pressure issues. They're going to say I have circulation issues. They're going to tell me I probably had a heart attack. Like, I don't know if I can handle this. I don't know if I can handle this. Like I, I broke down and I called my dad probably eight or nine o'clock that night and said, I need to go to a doctor tomorrow. <clears throat> and I realized, and this is, this is the, one of the stupid parts of this. I'm in my forties and I realized I had no idea how to see a doctor mm -hmm. because literally every doctor's appointment in my life had been made for me by an adult. And I was like, I, so I said to him, I said, I don't know where to go or what to do, <laughs> like, but I need to see a doctor. And he has a really good friend that's a doctor, a general practitioner. So he's like, let me call him, called him. My dad misinterpreted what I said was going on and thought I just had flu symptoms. So his friend said, yeah, oh yeah, bring him in in the morning. I'll squeeze him in before I have my first patient. So we get to this doctor's office. I probably had to rest six times walking into the office from, the, from the, my dad's truck. Um, sat in the, the waiting room, you know, the, the doctor's examination office. He walked in and he looked at me and immediately like the look on his face was like, oh shit, you, he's like, you look pale. And I'm like, uh-huh. Like I, I honestly didn't even know what to say at that point. He pulled out a pulse oxygen meter from his pocket, put it on my finger and it read like 86 or 87. And if you know anything about the medical industry, if you're below 97, you're in distress. If you're below 94, you're damaging your organs. Ooh. So he, he basically is like, um, you need to go to an emergency room right now. He goes, I probably should call an ambulance, but I'll let your dad drive you. He walked me out to my dad and said, go to the hospital now. He's like, do not stop anywhere. Don't make a phone call. Go to the hospital right now. Now, in, a, in another serendipitous move that you know I'll, I'll always be grateful for, we got to the emergency room and one of the guys that my dad has worked out with at the gym was working intake. And basically bumped me up to get me in the back really fast. So now at this point, I can barely breathe. I'm afraid I'm dying. I'm shaking because I'm terrified of what's gonna happen when these doctors start looking at me. And they wheel me into the back, throw me on a table, rip my shirt off and put an EKG on me immediately because they, they assume I'm a 350 pound guy. I must be having a heart attack, something like that's going on. They put oxygen on me. They're sticking me with needles. They're sticking an IV in me. And I'm kind of going in and out of it now just with panic because I have no idea what's going on. They take me from the emergency room into just another kind of secluded area in the emergency room. And I'm sitting there with my parents and the doctor comes in with my chest x-ray that they had done. And he says, do you know what an x-ray is supposed to look like? And I said, well, I know a chest x-ray should be black. And he's like, you're right. And he holds up my x-ray and it looked like two white lobes with thin black lines at the top. Um, and he says, there is so much bacteria in your lungs right now that we can barely get any oxygen into you. So they had the, the oxygen up as high as they can go. He's like, I'm going to immediately start you on three antibiotics. We're going to start a round of X, Y, and Z. He's like, you're being admitted. And I'm like, okay. And then as he was leaving the room, he said, um, if you had waited another three or four hours, you'd be dead. You, oh. you would not be alive. Um, and at that point, honestly, I had just, the fear had been so overwhelming. I just gave up on it. Like I, I literally went to that place of do what you need to do to keep me alive. You know, I'm doing all these things. Like I made that decision to fight for my life in February. I need to do that again now. Like I went right back to that place. Like I need to just submit, do what you need to do. When, you know, whatever we need to do, whatever tests you need to run, whatever you need to stick inside of me, do it. I was in the hospital for 17 days. Um, they actually beat the bacteria in about four days. <coughs> Excuse me. What was the bacteria um, from? Do you mind me asking? Uh, it was pneumonia. It was bacterial oh, pneumonia. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So it was pneumonia. Um, and then, but the problem was the pneumonia had been so intense in my lungs that it, it they, they describe it, the, the fancy medical term is my, my lungs were hepatic. Um, normally your lungs should be like cotton balls, should be like wispy like cotton balls. My lungs were like raw liver in terms of the texture because mm -hmm. so there was no, like most of my lung tissue could not take oxygen at that point. 
So they started me on steroids, you know, obviously not the kind of steroids that you take in the gym, like uh, steroidal medications. Uh, and the funny thing was they told me, now, have you ever had taken steroids before? And I'm like, no. And the, so the doctor is like, just know that you can hallucinate, like, especially with the dosage we're giving you, you could have some hallucinations, don't freak out. And I'm like, I don't think I've ever hallucinated in my life, but okay. Uh, for three nights, I was convinced that aliens were coming to get me in the hospital. And Oof. every time the nurses would try, every time the nurses would try to put a blanket on me at night, I would throw it off and tell them that the aliens were coming and I needed to be ready to go. Um, so that's kind of where I was mentally for a couple of days. Um, I was also at that point bedridden on intense oxygen. Um, I had a, a, a urinal right near my bed that I couldn't get to by myself. I was that weak. Um, like I said, I was there for 17 days. Uh, I stayed keto in the hospital. I will say that. Like, I'm going to grab some water because I'm going to cough again. Um, sorry about that. Um, no, you're fine. I stayed keto in the hospital. I had a lot of experiences in the hospital that were interesting because uh, they were looking at me as this 350 pound guy on oxygen and they all were making this assumption that I had just always been a 350 pound guy in really bad health. And so pretty much every new doctor and nurse that came in, I had to explain, well, actually I'm down over hundred pounds. Um, I, I turned the background on my phone into my before pictures. If I could just hold it up and be like, this is what I looked like six months ago. Okay. Um, because I would, I, they would ask me every day, so how, how much oxygen do you use at home? I don't use oxygen at home. Well, do you get around with a cane or a walker at home? I go to the gym five days a week at four o'clock in the morning. I don't use oxygen. I don't use a cane. And they're like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. So I had some great talks, like, <clears throat> with the hospital staff about keto and all of that. Like, I, I think I converted some of the nurses. Um, I had a doc. I, I had many doctors try to talk to me about weight loss surgery, and I'm like, I'm already, already on that road, dude. Don't worry about me. Um, I had a, a very scary moment one morning. They woke me up at six o'clock in the morning, and the nurse said, "The doctor thinks you're having a heart attack right now, so we need to get you down for an echocardiogram." And I'm like, "The doctor what?" And she's like, "The doctor thinks you're having a heart attack right now. We need to take you down for an emergency echocardiogram." So I'm, I'm going to give you too much information. Um, on the gurney on the way to the echocardiogram, I shit my pants, um, oh. freaking out, like literally. My body, there was a lot going on with my body at that point, and I was on medications that made that kind of control hard. But we got down to the, the, the room, and I said to the person, as they're getting ready to move me, I'm like, I've had an accident. And, the, and the, the orderly is like, this happens all the time. Don't worry about it. He's like, we'll, we'll grab you another, another whatever, you know, another dress. Basically. Well, if it makes you um, feel any, if it makes you feel any better, I was in the hospital about a month, month and a half ago, and the same motherfucking thing happened to me. So it was, yep. it was. I, I was like, at that point, I'm like, they think I'm having a heart attack. I shit my pants. Like, let's just let's have a party. Right. <laughs> so they're they're doing this this echocardiogram, and the funny thing is, so the person the tech doing it finishes, and like she's like, okay, so someone will come in and get you, and I go, um, how about the heart attack? On. Yeah, I'm like, I'm, I, they told me I'm having a heart attack. And she goes, oh, no, you're not having a heart attack right now. The doctor suspects that you had one in the past and wanted an echocardiogram done. I'm like, that is not at all what your nurse thinks. I'm like, that is not what the nurse thinks. So then the doctor eventually comes in to see me. And they determined that at some point in my past, I had a heart attack and didn't know about it. Um, not shocking, actually. Not shocking at all, um, you know, from someone who was 500 pounds, lost all the weight, gained that weight back really quickly. He thinks it was probably the summer I gained the weight back with the amount of fluid that was rapidly coming into my body, taxing my heart. Uh, there was no physical damage to my heart, but there was electrochemical signals that could tell them that there was at some point a heart attack that had happened. Sure. Um, and this led to when I finally was, I was released from the hospital to my parents' care on New Year's Eve. I was on oxygen still. I could barely walk to the, to the car. Um, my, my exercise at that point was I had a, a 50 foot cable on the oxygen machine and I would walk once around their dining room table and sit back down. And that's what I could do. And the first day that I actually got to shower on my own was like, we had a party. Like I recovered at their house for two months. Um, now the reason I go so in depth into this part of the story is because it's really relevant to me 
in that I had made that decision to fight for my life in February of 2017. And then I had to face the biggest fear of my life, which, you know, was seeing doctors, getting, having all that happen and having to face the reality of what I had done to my body, you know, the possible consequences of it. And I realized during all of that time that I still wanted to fight to live, that if it meant facing fears, I was going to do it. If it meant uh, like the pulmonologist in the hospital, he's like, so you don't have a regular doctor. And I'm like, no, he's like, well, we're getting you a regular doctor and you're going to see the regular doctor. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, don't bullshit me. You're going to actually go see this doctor. So I, I got a regular doctor. Um, I went and saw the pulmonologist. I actually had some very interesting conversations with the pulmonologist because he was one of the people that pushed weight loss surgery on me every time we talked. Um, he eventually even said, I know that you're, you're very successful at your weight loss, but you realize weight loss surgery might be the key to help you keep it off forever. And I said, um, as a doctor that I'm paying, I'm telling you, I don't want you to ever bring up weight loss surgery to me again. And he then admitted, he goes, well, just so you know, that with the BMI range you're in, we're required to bring it up every time we have a conversation. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but put a note in your file that says, I don't want you to talk to me about it again. Uh, you know, <laughs> we're done having that conversation. That's not happening. Don't worry about it. But I got into this place. Now, one of the things that I, I had a lot of time to read when I was in the hospital, a lot of time to read, a lot of time. I, I, I think I probably had more Amazon packages delivered to my parents' house during that time period than they had ever seen show up. Like it literally would be every day my dad would come in and be like, there was more at the bottom of the stairs. I'm like, yeah, those are mine. Bring them over to the couch. Cause I couldn't <laughs> get up and walk around to get them. I'm like, yeah, bring it over. Um, and it was during that time that someone had recommended to me a book by Ryan Holiday called The Obstacle is the Way, um, which was my introduction to Stoic philosophy and Stoicism. And I think in a lot of ways like that really helped cement for me everything I had been thinking about. Like everything that had come up to that point in my journey, like I realized that I had reached a point where I had to start focusing on what I could control. I had to start letting go of the things that I couldn't control. And I had to accept the fact that I could die any day and that I want that day that I was living to be my last. Did I want, when people think about me, to think about my last day, to be me 500 pounds alone in my apartment, shoving food in my face? Or did I want them to think about me showing to people that it's possible to change and it's possible to create lasting change in your life? Like, I had to start really thinking about how I wanted to be remembered when I did die, because I could still die any day. You know, any of us could still die any day. Sure. But I took the immediacy of it off the plate by making changes. And I continued my journey. Um, I hit some stalling points in my weight loss journey in 2018. And that's also one of the, the, the times that I would have given up in the past. But I was like, no, if, if what you're doing right now isn't working, let's find something else that'll work. Like, let's think about what are your options? How can you focus? What are you not doing? So I was starting to become very, I, I think I, I just started to become so keen about analyzing everything and thinking about how was, was I an emotional leader? Was I not an emotional leader? Was I tracking my food? Was I not? And I realized that there were some things I could tighten up. So I decided to hire a coach, um, someone who put me on a more structured keto program that I have been following. You know, I started tracking macros and calories and all that fun. Um, and it got me over that hump. It, it ended the stall and the weight gain that had started back and um, got me to the end of the weight loss portion of my journey, you know, just a couple months ago. Like I, I hit a point where I realized um, the number I, for a long time, I was chasing 199. You know, I was like, I want to be under 200 pounds. I want to be able to say that I'm under 200 pounds. And the lowest I got to was 205 pounds. Um, but I made the decision to stop because I realized that to get to 199, I could do all the help. I, you know, I have a lot of friends that are bodybuilders, a lot of friends that are in that, that space and there's tricks and things I could do to, to suck some weight off and get and see that number. But then I drink a glass of water and that number would go away forever. You know, what's more important? Is it what the number on the scale is or is it the fact that my, I can buy clothes in any store, my body can move, I can work out. I don't have to rest walking up the stairs anymore. I don't have to worry about going to new places because I'm going to break furniture. I can fit into my or car. Toilet. At one point in my, yeah, I'm not breaking toilets. I'm not breaking, pla I, when I was over 500 pounds, I flew in a small plane once and I bent the seat to the, it was one of those, those plane seats where it's almost like the U metal on the bottom, like an unsupported plane seat. I bent the seat, the plane seat to the ground by the time we landed. 
Like I was almost like reclined like in a dental chair by the time we landed. And the flight attendant had no idea what to do. She was like, I bet. we can do, you know, like, what do we do? Um, so all those things that, you know, I had allowed to escape my life were back. And I realized that um, I, it was time for me to start working on what comes next and to move the mindfulness of my work on weight loss into the mindfulness of my work on maintaining this and figuring out what it means to live my life now. And what does my relationship with food mean in this phase? And I, I spent a lot of my life identifying as the fat guy. And then I spent a lot of my life identifying as the guy losing weight. And now I realize that the challenge for me this next year is to work on who I am when the, my focus isn't on what the scale says. You know, who, who do I want to be? What does that mean for me? What do I want to give to other people? Um, and the thing is, this time I'm ready to ask those questions. I'm not afraid. You know, I don't have to retreat back to old behavior to be comfortable uh, because I know that the biggest thing I've learned is that on, on this journey that we're on, and whether that's your 500 pounds or you have 50 pounds to lose, or you're facing bankruptcy because of things you've done horrible in your business life or things along, you know, whatever your problem is, I think the biggest thing to remember is that the journey never ends. Like the, the challenges can't go away. And that when you stop putting challenges in front of yourself is when you start to get stagnant and the old behaviors come back, the old problems come back, you know? So now I work on new challenges and I work on new things to put in front of myself. And I realize that I may not be worrying anymore about losing a pound, um, but I have other things to focus on and I, I have other things to drive me forward. So, Gormy, you know, you, this story has, first of all, been absolutely mind-blowing and incredible, and there's so much power behind what you've done. You know, you've got, you know, and I say this, you know, in the nicest way, like, you, you, you've got to share this with more people. You've got to help people that, mm -hmm. regardless of where they are in their journey, your story alone would help almost anybody, really, in mm -hmm in a weight loss or weight gain, whatever journey. Um, and that's where you're going to be most effective. I feel like. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and those are things that I'm looking to do. I've actually just recently, um, less than a week ago, I started uh, working on co-coaching for a group coaching experience that I'm involved with. Um, and I will be um, putting into place doing some one-on-one -on -one coaching after that. Um, I'm not ready to talk details or kind of make announcements about when that's going to start or anything like that yet, but that is something that's in development. Um, I'm a part, an, a very active part of the keto community on Instagram and Facebook, and I'll actually be speaking at one of the big events this year at KetoCon, uh, sharing my story there. Sweet! Um, yeah, I'm really excited about that. Um, it, KetoCon is called the Stories and Science of, of Keto, and a big part of it is getting people who've used the keto diet to help themselves share their stories and be able to inspire other people. And I'll be a part of that this year. And I'm really excited about that. I'm actually going to get to record an episode of my podcast live at the, at the convention as well. Um, so I'm just looking to keep that growing and like keep looking, find avenues where like come on podcasts like yours and be able to share my story and connect with people and, and get people to realize that you can reach points in your life where it feels like you've tried and failed so many times that why should you keep fighting? And I'm just here to say that, like, as long as you can find that reason why you want to keep fighting, don't give up. Like, don't, don't count yourself out yet. Like, don't be ready to like throw the towel in because there's more there. And I'm not young by any means, you know, I'm not, I'm not aged, but I'm not young. You know, I'm in my, I'm in my mid forties, but I feel like in a lot of ways, like my life is really just starting. Like I, Shit, I feel like, yeah. you know, there's, there's so much in front of me that I could never do before. Like I'm in the process of planning um, to, to visit Europe in the fall um, because I always avoided international travel because when you can't fit into a plane bathroom, how do you fly for, for 10 hours? How do you fly for seven hours? Like when you, it's not possible for you to do that. Like never mind the cost of two planes, two seats on an international flight, but just knowing that you physically can't fit into a plane bathroom because that's where I was. Um, I had a very embarrassing incident on a plane when I was 500 pounds uh, because of that. Like there's things that you just physically can't do that I can do now. So I don't have to be afraid of them anymore. And so I'm just, there's a lot of different things um, that I've got coming up that I'm excited about. And so this is, yeah, I agree. This is, you're just starting, dude. You're just mm -hmm. starting. Like, wow. What, what, 
how much, like the, the amount of time that, that you've, I shouldn't say wasted because this was part of mm -hmm. your journey, you know, and this part of your journey is to help, you know, other people and to, and to tell them about this. And I love that you're speaking at KetoCon. I didn't even know there was such a thing, but I love mm -hmm. that. That's so fucking cool, dude. But I think you're right. Like, I, I don't think it's wrong to say that I wasted time because I think that's one of the big lessons from my experience is I did. I did waste that time. And I want people that are in their 20s and are 500 pounds to start thinking about what's going to happen in another 20 years. Like, are you still going to be here? Or are you just going to have, ex even, if, even if you're still alive in 20 years, let me tell you that just existing for 20 years is not worth it. Like mm -hmm. there's more out there, like there's more to do. So don't, I, I regret choices. There's a lot, like, like there's a lot I can dive into, like for myself that I dive into sometimes when I think about like choice, like things like I graduated with my undergraduate degree in government. Um, and I had opportunities to go to Washington and get involved down there, but I chose to head off in a different direction career wise because I wanted a less physically demanding, you know, work. I wanted to not, I chose to not challenge myself. I put myself into a place where I took opportunities off the table because of what I was putting on the table, you know, is, is cliche or silly as Such that sounds an like. Sounds I, perfect. It, it, yeah. Like I, 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 so I don't, and sometimes when I talk about that, people say, well, you can't live in regret. I'm, I don't live in regret, but I want you to know, that it's very realistic that I know that I've made choices based on this addiction to food that I have. I made choices. And so now I, I realize that I, I'm not going to make those choices again. And I want people to know that there are other people that have done those same things. Like every time I tell my story, I hear from someone that says, I did that exact same thing. I feel like I put myself into the same hole career wise because I physically couldn't do anything else. Like other people are doing these things and know that it's okay to want to make change and that it's, it's okay to want to step out of that place of complacency. And you have to figure out like, and again, it's so freaking cliche now. Like there's books called finding your why and find your why and what is your why and define your why. Like it's, I feel like Oprah Winfrey when I say that now, but it's really freaking important. And like, and for me, like one of the things that we were, we were talking about on a live with the, the group I'm coaching the other day was, um, Sometimes finding your why is about keeping asking yourself that question, why, until the bullshit falls away. Because like someone who wants to lose weight and says that they want to lose weight to look better in clothes, that's not the real reason they want to lose weight. It's got, it doesn't have any, it superficially seems that way, but there's something else going on. And what is it? So why do you want to look better in clothes? Well, I want to look better in clothes because of how people will treat me. Well, why do you care about how people treat you? Well, I care about how people treat me because of X, Y, and Z. Like keep digging and find something. Cause for me, it wasn't until I realized that I had that motivation that was more important than food that I made any changes. You know, I had to want to live. And for me, that was my why, you know, wanting to live. Why are you doing this? Because I want to live. Because for me, I was dying. I was like, let's not mince words. Let's not play around. I was dying. So not every person who's overweight is dying. You know, there's, there's, there's a dude out there or a woman out there listening who's 50 pounds overweight who really wants to change their life. And it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that they're going to die tomorrow. I understand that. But for me, that, that's what it was. And now I'm not dying anymore. You know, I'm not, you know, that's, right. I'm, I get, I get checked out by my doctor. My doctor loves my numbers. My doctor actually converted to keto himself. Um, so which is a whole nother story. Um, but now I think about like my why is to live my life. It's not just to live, but to live the life that I've earned back, you know, to not waste my time, to not feel like I'm doing anything that doesn't feel like it's a fulfilling experience to me. So my day job, my night job, all of them are things that I feel fulfilled by and motivated by and are things that I really enjoy. Um, and a big thing for me that's happened recently is I've stopped watching television. I've stopped watching television completely. Yeah. Um, I used to be addicted to television. I used to watch television every waking moment, mostly to escape what my life was like physically. And now I don't have Netflix or Hulu or any of those things. When I'm around people that are talking about television, I feel like I can't even relate to them anymore. Yes. It's not because I judge people for watching television. It's just that I've so moved myself out of that space because I'd rather use that time listening to podcasts or reading books or doing things that I feel I'm actually doing or right. learn, learning from 
instead of just vicariously experiencing something else. And so I'll, tell, you know. I'll, tell, I'll just tell you something really funny. I was at a birthday party on the 4th and I was sitting around, there was probably eight people and they had CNN on, right? Mm -hmm. And so like you, I very rarely watch television and I sure as mm -hmm. fuck don't watch the news. And so they're talking about the coronavirus and I'm sitting here like, okay, so I've heard about this. And they're like, what do you mean you've heard about it? I'm like, well, I mean, I, I heard it was going on some country or something. And they're like, no, like it's here. It, mm. It's really bad. And I'm like, really? Like, mm. I, I, I had no idea what supposedly the severity, which is still horseshit, I think, you know, right. in, my, yeah. in my opinion. Anyway, so I just, I, I just, I'm clueless, dude. I'm clueless. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, the other day I was, this was a couple of weeks ago and I'm leaving work and one of the women I work with is like, are, are you ready for the snow tonight? And I'm like, what snow? And they're like, it's been all over the news for two days. We're getting a big snowstorm tonight. And I'm like, uh, no idea. I had no idea. So then I started to realize that maybe at least I should check the weather, should know what's going on. You know, I do live in New England. I do need to know what the weather is oh, going to say, a, but you know, I, I, you know, maybe I should at least go online and see what the weather's going to be. But it's, it's amazing to me to think about changing the importance of, of things in our lives and how we can realign different things that used to seem like it. I used to love talking about television shows that I loved and was obsessed with. And I had so much space taken up in my living space by DVD copies of seasons of television shows. And now it's like, it's funny when I connect with people I haven't talked to in a long time and they bring up one of those things that I'm like, yeah, I don't even really remember that. Or like, I don't, I don't know what to say. Like I haven't yeah. watched the new, I don't watch the new season or I'm not going to see that or I'm not doing that. I'm sorry. Like, and I, sometimes people feel bad. They're like, Oh, I, you know, you're making me feel bad because I do watch TV. I'm like, you do what you want to do. Like, I think the bigger thing in my life is like, it, this has nothing to do. I'm not giving you a lecture about what you should or you shouldn't do. <laughs> like, I don't care. You want to watch TV, watch TV. You want to watch, you want to, you want to binge watch something for eight hours on a Saturday. And that's what you want to do with your day. Do it. But I'm going to do, I'm going to do something else. Like, you know, <laughs> I get up and I go to the gym most days, you know, at four 30 in the morning, I'm at the gym. Like, so I go to bed early, you know, and if there's a night that I can go to bed at seven o'clock and get eight and a half hours of sleep, I freaking love it. Like that's, yeah. you know, I prioritize things that move me closer to the things that are important to me. And I think that's just really been a big, a big part of this is realizing that my life, that losing weight and changing my health wasn't just about changing what I put on my plate. It was about changing my approach to everything in my life and about changing how I frame every experience that I have and the importance of those experiences and the importance of the people I want to be around and the people I want to build connections with. And uh, all of that, you know, adds up to the bigger picture. I totally agree. So Gory, where can people find you? We just, uh, sure. And, and also share where the, where the keto con is. Cause I think that's super sure. important. Sure. Well, keto con, if you go to ketocon.org, the, the full schedule has actually just been put up. Tickets are still available. That's in Austin, Texas uh, in June. That's, so it's coming up. You know, no, it's, I think we're actually a little under 100 days now until it happens. So okay. I actually went last year for the first time ever. And halfway through the conference, I said, I need to be on that stage next year. You know, I don't know why, like, I need to be on that stage. And so it ended. One of the last days, I, I grabbed the arm of one of the organizers and was like, and now there's, you know, at upwards of 3,000 people going to this conference. It's like, it's not like 200 people in a room. Like, it's a big, a big event. You know, it takes over the Palmer Center in, in Austin. And I was like, Brian, I want to be on stage next year. What do I need to do? And he's like, you're really asking me that as I'm running to another event? Like, he goes, we'll talk about it soon. Like, don't worry. The information will be out there. And so I started GMing the woman that is like kind of the head honcho. And I was like, Robin, you know, have you taken applications for speakers yet? I want to speak next year. And she's like... I've heard that you want to speak next year. <laughs> we'll make sure that you get an application. Don't worry. Um, so, I, you know, I was able to make that happen and I was really excited about that. So KetoCon is coming up in June. I will be there. You know, I, a lot of great people will be there. Um, if you're interested at all in the keto diet, like literally it's your Instagram feed come to life, like scientists, researchers, doctors, influencers, whatever you can think of, podcast people, um, health and fitness professionals, you know, celebrities like whoever you want to run into like there's some fitness celebrities that are there that you know it's mind-blowing to me some of the experiences i've had with them um and it was a life-changing experience to me i could talk for another two hours about ketocon last year you know what it was like for me to go and experience that but so i'm going to be back there again this year um 
if you want to connect with me now, uh, probably the best platform is Instagram. I use, I use that primarily. Um, Gourmet underscore goes underscore keto on Instagram. I am on Twitter. Twitter's a bit of a cesspool at times. You know, I feel like yeah. Twitter's, a, Twitter's a snipe and run place, like for people in a lot of ways, but I'm on Twitter trying to, to make, you know, a, a, you know, have some connections there. I've met some really great people at Gourmet Goes Keto there. No underscores, just Gourmet Goes Keto. Um, and you can find me on the Fat Guy Forum, which is my podcast. It's on iTunes and all the platforms. And um, I've have had some really, and the, the thing is like, just so you know, my, my podcast is not just keto. It's not a keto focused podcast. Um, I get some negative feedback from keto, people in the keto sphere sometimes. They're like, why don't you push keto on everyone that comes in the show? And I'm like, that's not the purpose. You know, my, the purpose of my podcast is to share the stories, the real stories of dudes that are, are battling their weight issues and what it means for them. And, you know, I, I was talking, I interviewed a guy today who um, was over almost 600 pounds, had gastric bypass, regained all the weight and was sitting on his front lawn in a chair with his young daughters. And one of them ran towards the road. And luckily she was fine. But he realized in that moment that there was literally no way for him physically to get up to save her if anything had happened. Like he could not move fast enough to stop her from getting to the road. And that was a big impetus for him to try again. Like it, there's experiences that people are having that I don't think we realize sometimes. And so I'm, I'm trying to provide a platform for guys to come on and share what it's like to go through that and then to make change and, and find ways to make change for themselves. So Good that's really shit. where you can find me. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Gourmet. Thank you so much, dude. I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing your story. Dude, it's super powerful, dude. It's almost gives me chills, man. Well, thank you, man. I, I appreciate it. I know, I know it took us some time to connect and find a time that worked for both of us. So I'm glad we were able to finally do it. Like I, I really appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk to you. My pleasure. And I'll, I'll let you know when this drops, it'll be a couple of months cause I'm pretty backlogged. Um, but, but I will, uh, what, what are we in March? I, I will make damn sure I get it out before June. Okay. What is the date on that? On the, on keto con? Um, it's Some, like the 12th, of, in 12th. June. Yeah. June 12th through the 14th. Okay. It'll be out before then. I'll cool. make damn sure it's out before then. Sounds good. So, all right, Gourmet. Thank you, dude. Awesome. I really appreciate Thanks, you, man. brother. Absolutely. Thank you, man. Sounds good. Well, you all have right. a good night, man. Good to talk Thank to you. you. Uh-huh. Bye.